I'm excited to be joined by Colin Butler, Global Head of Institutional Capital, and Matt Blumberg, VP of Institutional Capital from Polygon for our quarterly State of Polygon call. This call is going to cover several different topics around Polygon, including a quick history and background, the latest technical developments, partnerships and tokenization, and we'll wrap up the call looking forward towards the rest of the year around platform updates and other things to look forward to in 2023. Quick disclaimer before we begin, the information contained in this webinar is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. So with that, uh, why don't we get started? So Colin, looking to you, uh, for the benefit of those joining this quarterly call for the first time, can you give us a little bit of a background about Polygon? What is Polygon and what differentiates it from other layer ones and layer twos in the space? Uh, absolutely, Josh. First off, thank you for hosting. Uh, as always, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. So Polygon can be really thought of as a Ethereum scaling solution. So what that means to us is you think of the idea that Ethereum has 700,000 validators. It has an order of magnitude greater security than the next largest solution. And so Polygon's goal is to really provide access to cheap and fast Ethereum. So we do that via a variety of means. We have various products that enable that. We'll get into a little bit more of the technical details on this call. But the goal is to really get the next billion users uh, onto the blockchain through a service that is very easy to use. It's highly functional. It's efficient. Uh, and it ultimately comes at the speed that's needed with the security that's needed especially in our case, being in the, in the institutional capital seat, right? You need security that will secure billions and billions of dollars in transactions. And then ultimately to have the best of breed technology in the entire space to enable that. So that's the short, uh, I think in, in terms of the, the vision and the goal, what separates Polygon from other layer ones, layer twos, uh, is, is one largest ecosystem outside of Ethereum. And two, that real deep focus on, on security. Polygon essentially spent a billion dollars uh, on a technology called zero knowledge technology to, to really get that best of breed uh, sort of institutional level solution that we can make ultimately publicly available again in the interest of for, for the institutional capital perspective, rewiring the global financial infrastructure, uh, but from a firm perspective, really getting the next kind of hundreds of millions, if not billions of users uh, onto the blockchain in various capacities. So Matt, you know, Colin kind of gave us the polygon you know, backstory and overview, but I, I want to know about Polygon 2.0. So what is Polygon 2.0? What does it mean for the network and why should anybody that's listening care about it? Uh, thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to talk about Polygon 2.0 uh, as I have been for the last several weeks. Um, it's, a, it's a very exciting sort of change in the way that we're thinking about how, how all the different pieces fit together. So if we rewind a little bit, um, Polygon's taken a whole bunch of different approaches to, to scaling Ethereum, right? So our first chain, uh, Polygon POS, uh, went live a few years ago. Um, we're still seeing like super strong user traction there. Uh, we're seeing great applications built on top of it, uh, lots of TVL. Um, it's you know a flourishing ecosystem. It's been very successful, but it wasn't really like the you know it wasn't like the steady state of like what we wanted to build, right? We wanted to build something that really inherited more security from Ethereum uh, to sort of lever that, that you know, the, the world's like most secure decentralized settlement layer, right? Um, and so we spent a whole bunch of money uh, and resources and time uh, acquiring a bunch of teams and hiring the best in class talent from across the industry to work on a, a piece of technology called zero knowledge, right? Um, and so uh, the result of this was the ZK EVM, which went live a few months ago. Um, and we've seen, you know, great traction there. We can get on that in a bit. Um, but now, you know, we have this interesting setup where we have two chains, right? Uh, much like the wrapper. Um, and so we start with Polygon POS. And uh, yeah, I, I've, I've been going through two chains lyrics, trying to find a good one that, that might also apply to Polygon. And they're just way too explicit. <laughs> um, so uh, I feel like that's a chat GPT question. Find it. <laughs> I, I will, I'll try to come to one by the end of the uh, call. <laughs> um, so OK, so we've got Polygon POS and Polygon ZKVM. And they, they each have their sort of benefits and drawbacks. Um, POS, slightly cheaper fees, right? Um, it's really good for like experimentation. It's good for like NFTs and gaming and sort of like non-financial use cases. And then we really see ZKVM as, as being like the home of DeFi, 
right? Um, because it, it sort of brings that that level of security that users demand with like financial assets, right? Um, and then, you know, outside of all of this, we, we have a product called Supernets, right? Um, which is more of like our, our app chain product. Um, and that's really useful for when people need either like uh, more customizability of the chain. So maybe they want to know like who the validators are. They want to lock it down. Maybe they only want to allow like a couple of different contracts on there. Um, so if you're, you know, a gaming studio, this makes a lot of sense, right? Because you can have higher throughput, more customizability, um, and you can sort of lock down your chain to just being used for your application. Um, the problem with all of this is, is that like, so, so if you think about it, like Polygon is sort of building like the AWS of decentralized compute. We have a lot of different products for a lot of different use cases, a lot of different developers. Um, and there's something on the menu for everyone. Um, but we were, what we were sort of like lacking was that kind of coherent harmonization of the product suite, right? Bringing things together so that what's good for one part of Polygon is good for all parts of Polygon and all users benefit from sort of greater adoption. Right, um, and for that we sort of overhauled uh, a little bit of our of our like technical roadmap uh, in something that we call Polygon 2.0. Um, so Polygon 2.0 it, it breaks down into a bunch of different components, but the the large vision is block space is going to be plentiful in the future. Right, we're gonna have you know we have two chains, then we have three chains, then we have four, and we're gonna have this world where you can, thanks to zero knowledge technology, you can super easily and cheaply spin up a new blockchain that settles securely to Ethereum. This is a state of the world like we've never been in before. I, I think it's as big as the shift from proof of work to proof of stake. We're going from a world where block space is scarce to a world where block space is plentiful. Um, and, and it's not, and you know, the key thing here is it's not just any old block space, right? Like we saw this last cycle, there were a lot of, you know, sort of semi legit, like alt layer ones that were printing up a whole bunch of block space, but the key was they weren't secured by the full weight of the Ethereum staking value, right? Like that, that secure, that security is something that you don't get in any other ecosystem. And so, you know, you wind up making lots of different compromises. You have bridges to transfer assets. And then, you know, if a bridge fails, like, you know, losers get, or users get wrecked, right? Um, in 2022, we saw over a billion dollars worth of capital lost to bridge hacks. That's insane. Like for, for our industry, like, you know, it's, it's pretty incredible because every time one of these bridge hacks happen, you're like, all right, I guess that's it. No, one, no one's gonna trust one of these things anymore. But people are resilient, and the demand for decentralized applications is so strong that we committed, we're sort of as a community committed to continuing to use it, right? Um, what ZK unlocks is secure bridging. It unlocks the full Ethereum grade security for an arbitrary number of chains, right? So you have like, you can think of it almost as like a capital efficiency improvement. Right, where you have a certain amount of value that's staking Ethereum to prevent things like double spend and reorgs and all that. Um, but you can apply that now to any chain. Anybody can bring can can spin up a chain that permissionlessly settles to Ethereum. That's pretty powerful. Um, and so with Polygon 2.0, we have not just like plentiful, secure, scalable block space. Um, but we also have a unified liquidity layer. And this I think is like really crucial. So if you look at like the layer two landscape, there, there are a lot of plans for a lot of different layer twos, right? We have optimistic rollups, which are nice and, and easier to cheaper to spin up, but you know, lack in that security. Um, we have ZK rollups, we have lots of different kinds. Polygon itself has a couple of chains, right? And we're sort of starting to see just the first hints of like where the space is gonna go. It's gonna be hundreds of chains. It's gonna be thousands of chains all settling down to Ethereum. Um, that's really complicated when it comes to liquidity, right? Because if I'm a user, you know, and I'm, I have my funds locked up on one chain somewhere and I want to use them to do something on another chain. Now I either have to like trust a bridge, which is like, you know, not a great compromise to make, or I have to go back down to Ethereum, pay those gas fees, then send my uh, funds to the next asset or to the next chain, pay those gas fees. And the whole thing takes forever, right? So liquidity fragmentation is gonna be huge as we start to see more and more chains pr proliferate. Um, with Polygon 2.0, the sort of key unlock from my perspective is this unified liquidity layer, right? 
So you're going to be able to interact across any number of chains without really, uh, without needing to say like adjust your settings in MetaMask or whatever. It's going to feel like a seamless single chain experience, but with infinite boundless block space. Um, and that, that to me is like really, really powerful. Um, so at Polygon, we, we care about a few things, right? Uh, there, we care about user experience primarily, but it comes from a few angles. So user experience is not just for the user, it's also for the developer, it's also for the staker, right? And Polygon 2.0 has a little piece uh, of each of these baked into it. So for the user, you have access to unified liquidity across all the chains, which is like huge, right? Um, it's a little bit like if you're in you know, Manhattan and you go into like one skyscraper, right? To have like a meeting with Colin. Um, and then you want to go have a meeting with Josh at the next skyscraper. You have to go all the way back down to ground level, take the subway, and then go up into the next skyscraper. But if there was some kind of like tunnel vision web of you know walkable, walkable spaces in the sky, right? Now you can get from meeting to meeting way more quickly and more easily. And the subways suffer less congestion as a result, which brings down gas fees for everyone overall, right? Um, the, you, you don't have to sit in traffic going between meetings. You don't have to think logistically about going upstairs and downstairs all these different times. It, it unlocks sort of like that scalability in the sky. Um, and, and so, um, so that, that's sort of the first thing from the user uh, experience perspective. For a developer though, um, they need to know that like when they deploy contracts, they can have like the expected behavior that they would have on Ethereum, which is why we invested so much money into the ZK EVM. It was sort of like the proving ground of like, wow, we can do this. We can actually have a full on like EVM compatible chain that settles to Ethereum using ZK proofs. That's like something we didn't think we were going to see for years. And we've managed to like pour gasoline on the fire and accelerate it into existence today. Um, so for, from a developer perspective, you can spin up and, you know, all our code is open source. And so it's really easy to spin up any number of these things, but you can spin up your own you know, uh, L2 with a centralized sequencer, with a decentralized sequencer. You can spin up a supernet that settles permissionlessly, you know, through ZK to Ethereum. Like, um, from a developer experience perspective, it truly is like best in class. Um, but the third piece of this is the staker experience, right? Stakers are like crucial, obviously, to any proof of stake blockchain um, or, or blockchain network. Um, and so for that, we've rolled out something called the staking hub. So you're going to be able to stake your Matic um, for any number of chains, right? This is called restaking. It was sort of like popularized with like Eigenlayer. Um, you can sort of think about it that way. Um, what this means is that at, at a layer two level, you're getting all of the stake of like the full set of Matic validators on every chain that, that opts in, right? But on a layer one level, you get all of the stake of Ethereum. So you're getting like security every step of the way uh, through like true de decentralization. Um, so those are sort of like the core components of Polygon 2.0. And, and what, it, what it gets you is a set of interoperable, cheap to use blockchains that settle to the world's best settlement layer, Ethereum, um, with best in class security through ZK, right? So you don't have to trust anyone. Um, and you, know, you can spin up marginal block space for effectively free. Right, And when you start to give people effectively free block space, you're going to see innovation proliferate like crazy. So it's a little bit like, you know, back in the day, if I was running a Web 1 or a Web 2 company, I'd have my own servers. I might have had to have my own server farm or a building somewhere with cheap electricity. And I'd have to have technicians going in to service my servers. And then we got the cloud, right? And it abstracted all of that away. And it made server time marginally cheap. So if you wanted to spin up a startup, it was very, very cost efficient to do that. You didn't have to shell out all the fixed cost of, of like buying a whole server. Um, this is going to do something similar for the decentralized web, right? It's going to make it so that anybody with a good idea can spin up a secure blockchain instantly, right? And, and it's all sort of like brought to you by the, the like best in class ZK technology. Um, so that's, that's Polygon 2.0. It's this vision of a world where you have... A you have a unified liquidity pool, so you never have to worry about like where are my assets, right? You have like super cheap block space, so you never have to worry about what happens if gas fees go up. You have full customizability, so if you're an enterprise and you need something special out of it, like say you're building a game or whatever, you might need special features. Uh, and we can talk about like the IMX partnership, right? You you have that as well. 
Um, it's this vision of just a, like plentiful block space. It takes you from this scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset. And that's what can really unlock a lot of innovation for the space. You kind of went into like two or three or four of my following questions. So I appreciate that. So now I'm going to try to kind of catch back up to where we are. But that was it. That was an awesome answer. So I have a, I have a bunch of, I guess, follow up questions. My first one is right now, Polygon ZK EVMs TVL is sitting, you know, around $30 million, whereas Polygon, it's, you know, itself is at about a billion in TVL. Do you see the ZK EVM TVL overtaking the TVL of the main chain at, at some point? And do you, do you envision that it happens soon? Uh, absolutely. I think, I think that's kind of the plan, right? So um, the reason it's been slow, there's sort of two reasons it's been a little slower to date than I think some people expected, right? Uh, the first is that we're growing an entire ecosystem here. And so in order to have that, you need to have like every layer of like the food chain, if you want to think about it that way, deployed. Um, and so that's not actually that fast, right? If you want to get like compound deployed on the ZKVM, you have to go into like the compound DAO, uh, into the governance forums, you have to educate people, you have to show them that like, yes, in fact, the contracts can be deployed there. Um, and only after you get like compound and Aave and Uniswap, can you start to get like the really interesting stuff. So we've taken kind of like a, like a two pronged approach here. The first is getting the incumbents, like people like Uniswap to deploy the contracts just so that like people that are building applications on top of them have access, right? Um, and the second one is sort of like helping our builder community to deploy their own like homegrown versions so of what, what is the lift, right? Like if you're Uniswap, Uniswap is already on Polygon and you want to move to Polygon ZK VM, what is the actual dev work that's required? It, it's pretty it's pretty simple, right? Because in general, the contracts are plug and play. There's like a couple of exceptions, but generally speaking, if you're a builder and you deploy, you can deploy your contract to Ethereum, you can deploy the same contract to ZKVM, just like out of the box, one click, right? Um, every time we hit any kind of friction there, it gets like, you, you can just drop a message in the Discord. It gets escalated to our developer team like immediately. And we figure out a solution like right away. Because if one person's having a problem, a lot of people are probably having a problem. So from a technical level, it's pretty straightforward, right? Like it's generally, you can just pre plug and play, like deploy. Um, it's more social. Uh, and I think part of the issue is that like, if you look at Sushi, right? When you go to Sushi Swap and you select your chain, the drop-down menu goes on forever. I mean, there's, there's a zillion chains on there and you wind up distracting users. Um, and it's, it's not good for Sushi. It's not good for the user. It's not good for the, you know, the underlying like blockchain either. Um, because that sort of fragmentation of attention is like the opposite of success in crypto, right? You, attention is like the scarcest resource, right? Um, and so generally speaking, the pushback is usually like, well, we don't see enough TVL today, so we don't think that your chain is like worth putting on our website, basically. But uh, in terms of deploying contracts, everyone's like, all right, well, that's easy enough. I'll just do that. But until you sort of get the, um, the you know, ZKVM logo on the Uniswap website, uh, you're going to hit like frictions with like user adoption. Yeah. So, so do you think it's a, a chicken and the egg problem a little bit? Is it a, like, and what do you think comes first? Is it the applications or do you think the users are going to drive it? Uh, it's got to be a little of both in tandem, um, right? And it's, a, yeah, it's a chicken egg, like cold start problem. Um, but having said that, what we've seen now is, you know, by any measure, a success, right? Like 28 million is, is not no money. I mean, it's, right? du it's, doubled, it's doubled since June almost, right? So it, it is growing pretty fast. Yeah. And, and it's growing like, uh, it, you know, the, the pace of like progress, at least from like which applications are deploying, um, is growing exponentially, right? Um, so if you look at uh, if you look at that, you can point to it and be like, wow, OK, there's like a viable ecosystem here. And then from there, it's just a question of how big it needs to get before you get like the really heavyweight players like the Uniswaps of the world to, to deploy. And, you know, Uniswap themselves have, have come out and said, like, look, like, we want to be really careful. We don't want to deploy just anywhere, right? Um, if you look at Aave, right, they deployed to a network called Phantom, uh, RIP. <laughs> uh, well, maybe it's still alive. Um, and, uh, and they actually had to shut down operations there because there was a bridge hack. And so, like, many of the assets that were in Aave were like 
uh, or sorry, there wasn't a bridge hack of the of this one specifically, but there was a bridge hack of like a similar bridge to the one that Phantom uses. And Ave went into their governance forums and were like, "Hang on a second, if there's a hack here. All the assets are like called into question. Um, maybe we expanded too quickly because the name of the game last cycle was like deploy as many places as possible. Now people are being a little bit more careful, and that's where I'm like really optimistic on zkVM is like. The security that you get from ZK makes it so that you don't need to worry as much if you're a protocol about like, should I deploy here? Is there enough like security guarantees that like users aren't going to get like wrecked? Um, but uh, in general, it's going very very smoothly. So the layer two sort of thesis has has taken over, and uh, more and more protocols are starting to realize that like. This is where I need to focus my my development efforts and and my marketing and all that. Um, and then if you look at Polygon, it's like, well, look at the success of Polygon POS, and you're extrapolating to you know what could it do now that it's like zk secure, right? Because if you're like a whale or if you're institutional or whatever, you might have felt uneasy about bridging to POS, even though it was it was a very good like bridge architecture. Um, you're gonna feel a lot more confident though about zk VM. And so uh, I, I think that Can you clarify it's... what it is about ZK versus like an optimistic roll-up? Just in very simple terms, because I mean, there are a lot of people listening that are technical, but I think a number of people, including Colin and myself, are not as technical. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what is kind of the, the simple explanation of why it is so much more secure than things we've seen in the past? So with, with an optimistic roll-up, um, it... Uh, it's it's secure in theory, right? Um, there's two reasons why it's less secure, though. Uh, so the first one is today, the development work just hasn't been there. So if you look at optimism, like there's supposed to be a rollup is optimistic because we assume everything's good. We assume that people are not trying to like withdraw assets that, that they don't actually own. We take an optimistic view of it. And then if somebody does try to like exploit it or commit fraud, um, anybody can submit a fraud proof, right? Uh, that says, hey, whoa, 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 Matt's trying to take assets out that he doesn't actually own um, on the layer two. He's trying to withdraw them to the layer one. Like, don't let that happen. But in the meantime, you need to have like a waiting period of like Matt tries to withdraw a million ETH and then like Matt gets to withdraw a million ETH. And somewhere in the middle, someone has to submit a fraud proof to say like, whoa, 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 Matt, Matt's trying to commit fraud. Don't let him do that. Um, what we sort of settled on as a community is seven days. Right, and so this really slows things down in a world that moves as fast as crypto. Seven days is like an eternity, and so in practice, people don't actually use this like secure like on ramp off ramp. Uh, in practice, they use like more something that looks closer to a bridge. Right, they use one of the classical. They use like Synapse or something. It's a custodial bridge. There's like five validators, and if they got hacked, like then all of the assets would be at risk. Right, and this is what happened with Nomad and all, all this other stuff. Um, or, you know, the wormhole hack, right? Um, so the problem is that, like, the technology is a little too clunky, right? Seven days is way too long to ask someone to wait to withdraw their assets, right? Um, but you need to have that waiting period because you, you need some period of time for people to, like, prove the optimistic assumption false. Um, and so in practice, everybody just uses an unsafe bridge anyway. With ZKVM, the waiting period is 10 minutes, Right. And with ZKVM, we're submitting a proof instead of like assuming things are good and only proving that there was fraud. What we're doing is we're proving every single time that everyone is allowed to withdraw the assets that they're requesting. So like it's a little bit like uh, with optimism, it's like trust but verify. And with ZKVM, it's like prove it every single time, right? Um, and those are those are different security assumptions for different use cases, right? Um, but that's where the security really comes in. So I, I have a million other questions for you, but Colin, I, I, I'm waiting eagerly to start asking you questions as well. So let's pull you up here. So in 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 the past couple of months, uh, Polygon has a, a number of uh, notable uh, collaborations and partnerships. Uh, I'm mostly excited about, you know, some of the ones like Franklin Templeton, uh, as well as Google Cloud and Deutsche Telekom. Can you elaborate on why these partnerships are important and what they do for Polygon? Uh, and how do you think about the success of these partnerships, right? When you look at one of them, what leads you to say, you know, over the years in crypto, we've seen so many partnerships and partnerships and partnerships, 
But a lot of times it's just that initial announcement and no one kind of goes back and revisits how, you know, practically beneficial the partnership has been to the, the product itself. So I'm wondering why those partnerships are important and how you quantify the impact of those partnerships. Yeah, first off, Josh, I personally love listening to Matt talk. Like, I, I'm so fascinated. Well, by I know you and I are both in awe. It's I can like, hear him forever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but what what the kind of Matt's speech and your question have in common, and in our kind of side of the equation, is that if you want to see mass adoption, you actually have to abstract away the tech. It just flat out too complicated for every single individual to get into the weeds, to get to the level of knowledge that Matt has, which is completely incredible. Uh, but for my side, if you're thinking of mass adoption, those partnerships that you just mentioned are great examples of how I think about success in terms of mass adoption. So let's unpack it a little bit. If you, if you take a look at Franklin Templeton, I think Franklin Templeton is a really good idea of a forward leaning financial institution that shows the world that you can get adoption in a way that's compliant with the current regulatory infrastructure. So there's an idea, I think, within blockchain that regulation has a potential to stifle innovation. The folks at Franklin Templeton have been working with the regulators for years to get a product that is beneficial to their end user in terms of 24-7 trading uh, and ultimately lower cost. And then if you're kind of a, a blockchain kind of maniac, you can get into a massive explosion of potential in innovation using ideas like Franklin Templeton tokenizing their, their Benji money, money market fund on Polygon. And you could call that just the start. But I, I'm not going to get into that because that's, that's up to them to disclose. Like as, you know, as they kind of get approvals for specific items. But I think what's most important is the idea uh, that it really represents in terms of a tier one trillion dollar plus institutional player heavily leaning into blockchain because they see all of those potential hundreds of use cases in terms of making capital more efficient, increasing revenue, saving costs, de-risking processes, you know, Wall Street back office processes and settlements processes. And, and they could be thought of as, as kind of a thought leader, right? Like Jenny Johnson got on CNBC and she talked about this grand vision uh, and, and so that's one of the reasons why I think we're really excited about collaborating with folks uh, like Franklin Temple Pickens. They, they really represent the vanguard of what is possible within traditional finance uh, on the blockchain. So for us, super, super exciting. I think a lot of it probably speaks for itself in terms of the, the idea that how important that is to the ecosystem, right? The entire blockchain ecosystem. If you think of an idea like Google Cloud, Part of the idea there for us, I think that's exciting, is it, it allows the technology to, again, be abstracted away. If you think of an idea like there's a financial institutional partner that wants to use a Polygon supernet or in the near future, a ZK supernet, there's an idea that maybe, well, do you have to stake? Like, how exactly do you provide security? Google Cloud allows that process to really abstract away the, the kind of deep crypto part and therefore further enable adoption. So I think if you, if you look at the, the partnerships that have been announced in the past, what they represent is a really scalable way for, for Polygon as an entity to achieve its goal of mass adoption. If you look at Starbucks or Nike or Reddit, these folks have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of users uh, that can now access blockchain, blockchain technology without having to spend the hours and hours if not years, uh, that, that Matt has put into understanding this technology at a deep level, but they can really pick it up uh, kind of off the shelf, so to speak. So hopefully that unpacked your, uh, your question uh, a little bit in terms of like how we do partnerships, why they're important. Uh, and, it, and if I had to succinctly answer it, it would be allows for mass adoption. And so then is the quantification of the success of those partnerships, how much adoption is reached? Like what does... What does mash adoption practically mean to you? Does it mean your grandma is using Polygon? Like what, what, how do you view mass adoption both in the next year or two or three years, but also 10 years from now? My grandmothers, may they rest in peace. Hopefully they're using blockchain. Uh, <laughs> but for, for, for the people on this call, I think it represents, you could think of it in a lot of ways, but for us, it's number of people, right? One metric is like, can we, because all of us working deep within the industry think that this is like a revolutionary technology, 
we want to see a billion people benefiting from this technology. A billion out of the eight billion people in the world is, is kind of like our, you know, kind of our, call it our next milestone, right? That's our goal. So one is number of users, but you can quantify it in a bunch of different ways, right? Number of transactions they get on chain, uh, daily active users, number of wallets. But the idea that, that many of Franklin Templeton's clients use their money market fund, even in some cases as a sweep fund, and Polygon can provide that inherent value to all of those users of the, of the blockchain, that's kind of, you know, that, that's kind of where we want to play. And so the other kind of, uh, I guess, follow-up question that I have is you, you spend all of your time or, or a significant percentage of your time on institutional. And so what, when you think about the use cases today for institutions and the reason that institutions should be talking to Polygon and should be interested in Polygon, can you explain those different things? We obviously spoke about a money market fund, but can you talk about like the different types of institutions that are interacting with digital assets and where you think the opportunity is for those different types of institutions? Yeah. And by the way, that's a huge question. I mean, I could talk about that for the next probably 12 I, hours. Why I wanted but, that smile. I got, I got what I wanted. <laughs> so if, if, if I could try to be succinct, uh, a couple of the major categories are investors, large asset managers. Uh, probably a subset of that could be private equity funds and hedge funds. Uh, then there's banks, brokers, exchanges. There's a variety of different financial players that are interested uh, in, in working with Polygon to, to onboard and make use of the technology. That's a very broad you know, class of players. The reasons why they're doing that, again, are, are increased revenue for, for the entity, uh, cost savings from their perspective. And ultimately, it comes down to the client. It's a, it's a better offering for the customer. And let me try to create a, a hypothetical future, a discrete example of that, just to kind of solidify it in everyone's minds. Think of the idea that now you currently have a bunch of illiquid assets, call them private equity funds or real estate funds. And in a hypothetical future scenario, you can go to one place, you can purchase those assets on chain, transact in those assets 24 seven. So you have 24 seven liquidity and you could ultimately also borrow against those illiquid assets to free up near-term capital for other investments or cash flow management needs. I would say at, at its extreme, it becomes an order of magnitude better solution for customers than, than the prior solutions. And to some degree, there's also some democratization, democratization of assets. You know, you think of the idea that Hamilton Lane tokenizing a polygon, they take um, an illiquid asset that previously you have to really be that qualified purchaser, have five million dollars more or more investable assets, and shift the mix toward the accredited investor, where you know you now have like a ten thousand dollar minimum. Those are all ideas within the institutional space that I think are incredibly powerful and are reasons why the blockchain is very valuable for that constituent base. So I just want to give a quick shout out to a bunch of viewers, you know, giving, uh, sending some nice comments, uh, talking about the projects that they're building on Polygon. So just a, a quick shout out. And, and to anybody watching, uh, to anybody watching now that has a question for, for either Colin or Matt or both, uh, feel free to drop it in the comment section. We see all your comments and, and we appreciate you guys listening. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to move back to, to Matt with my next question. Um, you know, you kind of alluded to gaming, uh, and I'm curious as to uh, the role of ZK EVMs in gaming uh, and how uh, ZK EVM is going to facilitate, uh, you know, the, the development of more Web3 games and, and the driving of mass adoption to those games. Uh, and, and I think, you know, the one thing to, to talk about there as well is, and, and you, you alluded to this, is, is the partnership uh, that you guys have with Immutable and, and maybe speaking about that a little bit as well. Yeah, um, the, the, the Immutable partnership was like super exciting, right? Um, it, the, that team has built just like great technology and great tooling so that anybody who wants to build a Web3 game can sort of like quickly and easily plug into their APIs, plug in their smart contract libraries, uh, plug into sort of like the Immutable like tech stack uh, and deploy like quickly and easily. So Immutable is sort of this like middleware provider, right? Where they, they make it super, super easy for game developers to, to build out like Web3 functionality into their games. Um, 
when we announced that partnership, it was shortly after just the launch of like ZK VM as we know it, right? Which is like the you know second chain, two chains, um, and ZK VM has sort of been like where we where we expect like DeFi activity to flow to, right? Because it has that sort of like best in class security. Um, but for non financial use cases, the sort of set of trade offs that you have to make looks very different. Right. So if you're just like a small, you know, gaming studio or like a, you know, an individual like developer, you might choose to just build directly on Polygon POS because you're building out a proof of concept or something. But, you know, if you're like slightly larger, maybe you have a few devs on your team and, and you have like clarity as to what you want your product to be and you have like a target audience, um, Immutable can be a really great choice because it allows you to focus on doing what you do, which is building games without having to like worry about you know the blockchain side of things quite as much. Um, and so it's kind of interesting because we started to see this model of where like on, on the immutable ZK VM, the gas token will be IMX, but the staking token for you know when we when the sequencer decentralizes will be Matic, right? And so you have this sort of like two token model and it, it starts to sort of paint a picture of where I expect um, the, the construct to evolve to in, in coming years, where you have a lot of these chains that are built on Polygon technology that want to interoperate with like the Polygon unified liquidity from Polygon 2.0. Maybe they want to access the, the staking hub, right? Um, and so Matic sort of serves as that like staking token that secures the network, but they want to have like customizability of the gas token, right? They want to have customizability of like the contracts that are allowed to deploy there, but they still want to get that, that high quality ZK powered um, security. That's where like the ZK VM for IMX comes in is they can sort of share in the value capture by having IMX as their gas token and, you know, potentially like marketplace token or whatever. Um, but everything is still sort of secured by Polygon's technology and Polygon staking token Matic. Um, that to me is like, a real like mind fuck, right? In terms of like how we think about usage of these tokens in the space. For Polygon POS, the gas token was Matic and the staking token was Matic. For ZKVM, the gas token is ETH, right? For IMX ZKVM, the gas token will be IMX. You can imagine like a whole bunch of other examples where maybe the gas token is a stable coin. Maybe you don't have gas because like, you know, uh, interaction with the chain is sort of like limited to, to prevent like, you know, denial of service attacks, right? Um, there's a lot of different constructs you can think of, but with respect to gaming, we sort of feel passionately that gaming is going to be a, like the, one of the major like routes of onboarding into Web3 for people. It's going to be like you play a game and you don't download a, a MetaMask wallet or anything to start with. And then a few levels into the game, they tell you, hey, you've earned some points. Why not like stake them or sell them or earn some yield on them, lend them out? Um, and in order to do that, all you have to do is like set up your MetaMask wallet or, you know, I, ideally it'll be like something a little more user friendly, right? But gaming as sort of like an onboarding mechanism for mass adoption, I think is going to be absolutely huge. It's really easy to forget, but like the video game industry does more revenue than like movies or music, right? Um, it's enormous. Um, and people that like video games, they love video games. Um, and so, uh, it, it, it winds up being like a really powerful mass adoption, like onboarding tool. And we wanted to make sure that we were partnering with people that were building the best in class technology. And so that's where the ZK, like IMX, ZK VM comes in is like IMX has already built out this like incredibly powerful tech stack. They have a number of successful games already. Uh, they have relationships with studios. They have like the customer onboarding funnel. Um, and they have all the middleware that a lot of the people that come to us saying, hey, I want to build a game. How do I do it? You know, a lot of them need that tooling. Um, that's, you know, that's like perfect for, for that set of users. Um, we wanted to make sure that those people are also getting access to like best in class scaling technology through Polygon, um, as well as like, you know, our user base, our community, our ecosystem, our liquidity. Um, and so it's a win-win for everyone. Um, but yeah, I think that was kind of, what we're thinking where like, you know, you might be wondering like, what, how do we tell people where to build, right? Or should they be building on POS? Should they be building on ZKVM? Should they be building on the IMX ZKVM? Should they be building their own chain, right? Um, and the answer is yes, right? They should be on whichever one of these is right for them. Um, we have a tool for every, you know, 
possible like target uh, user uh, or de developer, right? Anybody that wants to build a game can find the best possible place to build it somewhere in the Polygon ecosystem. It's just a question of like, what kind of support do they need? Do they need customizability for XYZ? What kind of security do they need? What kind of gas fees are they targeting? Um, and, and all of that um, sort of is reflected in the, the IMX ZK VM, where it's like, we're super flexible, right? Around like how our technology gets used. We want to make sure that we're, you know, we invested so much in building it. We want to make sure it's getting as much usage as possible. And so one of the things, and I think um, Colin might have alluded to it, but EA Sports and Nike uh, are joining forces in an exciting collaboration, integrating Nike's digital collectibles into EA games via the dot swoosh web three platform, which is built on the Polygon network. Um, can you, you know, shed a little bit of light on, you know, uh, how, you know, the unique application of Polygon, uh, might, you know, fuel the growth, uh, uh, for both EA sports and Nike, uh, and open doors for potential opportunities. So kind of curious as to what the benefit to EA and Nike is, what the benefit to Polygon is and where you see that kind of, do, do you see that as being, something that other companies then look at and come to Polygon and saying, hey, you know, we want to build on Polygon. You know, it's exciting for for this or that reason. Yeah, I, you know, I think broadly speaking, that that's one angle of partnerships, like to your question earlier that you asked Colin around like, hey, we've seen a lot of partnerships. They make a headline and then they don't go anywhere, right? Like um, the, you know, what, how do we, how do we think about that, right? One part certainly is like, people make a splash and then other people want to know what to do and it sort of de-risks the platform, right? So if you're at Nike on their metaverse team and you're trying to figure out who to go with, well, you might look at like what other big names in metaverse are building and where are they building, right? If you're like, if you're a large financial institution and you see the Franklin Templeton product, you might be like, okay, now it's a clear thing for me. Like I want to capture users that are interested in this sort of thing and they're all on Polygon because of Franklin Templeton, but also it sort of de-risks the tech stack, right? Like if you're, you know, like we've all, we're all surrounded in the space 24 seven, but like for a lot of people, they're working in a large enterprise. They might be like the only person trying to push for any kind of like web three integration. Um, they need to sort of sell their managers on like, how do, how am I going to build it? Right. Or is this, is this worth pursuing? And once you get there, it's like, okay, how am I going to execute it? And it just substantially de-risks it when, like, you know, everybody's going with Polygon. It's it's a little bit like you're not going to get fired for choosing Polygon over something else because all of your competitors are also choosing Polygon over something else, right? It, it's just sort of like the de facto place to build. And um, the the other angle there that this kind of shows is these uh, these headlines, these announcements, they're not just hollow, right? Like they're providing like real actual products that people can like see and use. So dot swoosh is like super, super tangible. I absolutely love this as an example use case because when you're playing an EA sports game, you can see your NFTs that, you, that you've bought through the dot swoosh program on your player's feed. Uh, it's like, it's very meaningful. It, and, you know, we have a, there's a similar partnership to integrate dot swoosh with, uh, with Fortnite, right? And now you can port your assets from game to game. This is something we've been talking about forever, right? Like, true own ownership of an asset is like, you can use it permissionlessly where you want, right? And this is like the first real example we've seen of being able to buy an asset in one place and use it in several others. Um, and, it, and it allows you to sort of feel that true digital ownership because you can start to associate it with like your, your digital identity, right? Um, but you can also sell it, right? You know, there's like huge like over-the-counter skins markets for a lot of games. Right. And historically, it's been very difficult to monetize as a player or as a collector. Um, you know, your your skins lived in someone else's database and like you had no control over it. Um, if you look at Roblox, for example, right, like they have their own currency and the exchange rate is like when you put a dollar in, you get, you know, uh, you get one Robux. But when you try to pull that Robux out as a dollar, you get 10 cents. Right. This is like completely changing the paradigm because it brings true like efficient so economic where, like markets. So is the re is the primary sale marketplace Nike 
are they also the re the the resale marketplace and can a user pull the digital collectible into like a separate polygon wallet like how does that actually functionally work uh, yeah, it's like the, the, these assets are, are represented as like true assets on chain, right? So it should be like, I mean, I, I haven't used the dot switch program, full disclosure, but yeah, I think generally the setup is Nike is the originator, right? They're like the primary sale. Um, and then I think they probably operate a secondary market. But the nice thing about having interoperable assets is you can trade them on any exchange, Right, you can transfer these things. They're not like sold on NFTs. They're they're like genuine like NFTs. Unless um, unless it's like custodial by Nike, and then they don't allow you to withdraw. Which was like, there were a couple platforms, or there are a couple crypto platforms that that do. But uh, but ideally, yes, and in yeah. non custodial, then totally. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I'm pretty sure. Look, Nike's been very forward with their with their like metaverse strategy, right? Between like their acquisition of um, I'm spacing on the name, um, but they they made like a really large acquisition of like a, a metaverse like fashion brand. Um, they uh, they they've been like I think they've done a really good job of executing, um, and like that was on Ethereum, but they're also executing stuff on Polygon, right? And the Dot Swoosh program kind of reflects that like they want to be like the leaders in this because if you look at nike like a huge part of their market is like collectors right um and for in a digital world it's only natural that like you need to get with the program and make sure that the digital collectors are also like enabled to to buy and sell your products um but yeah i i don't think it's custodial i, I think there's probably an option for a custodial wallet right um it's probably you know which is always a good idea for you know, gaming companies and, and whoever to like onboard people more easily. Um, but I can't imagine that their vision is to like, you know, well, I mean, if it's not, if it's not right, that that's incredibly beneficial to the Polygon brand as well. Right. Like if you're using your Nike NFT and then you want to bring it to a third party marketplace, all of a sudden you're on, you know, open seas Polygon page and you're looking at other things as well. Right. So it, it creates, some incentive for the user to interact with the rest of the ecosystem, which is, is kind of interesting. But yeah, I and mean, then for like gaming that, studios, right? Yeah, they're looking at it like, okay, wow, like look at what this did for for you know for EA, right? Look at what this does for Fortnite. I need to get some of these digital assets into my game too. I need to make sure that users feel like you know when they buy one of my assets, they have true ownership. When they buy an asset from another game developer, they don't. Um, and so. Yeah, like it's like it's it's pretty interesting because the sheer number of eyeballs that are going to be looking at these dot swoosh shoes is enormous. Like these are like several of like the most successful game franchises ever. Um, so I, I think it's going to be really, really meaningfully helpful for onboarding people. So, you know, the custodial versus non-custodial debate kind of brings up a good point, which is or good question, which is do users need to know that they're using polygon for value to accrue to polygon because in the case of aws for example you know we're using a live streaming service i don't know it could be hosted on aws could be hosted on google cloud i have no idea i don't really care right and so does it matter to polygon or do you think it matters in the long run that the user knows that they're interacting with polygon or is it okay if the user is being abstracted away is there one bet is, is is there more benefit one way or the other uh from a benefit perspective i i think that it's okay to abstract right where i get worried about abstraction is on a security perspective right of like you know if the user doesn't know which chain they're on they might not know how much economic security is is being used to like secure their assets uh but that's where like zk tech becomes so powerful is that like you can you know you can abstract away everything and still know that like if there is ZK being involved, you have certain security guarantees, right? That like no one's gonna be able to like commit fraud, right? And like steal your assets or like print assets out of thin air. Um, for the user experience perspective, I think it I, I think it doesn't matter if like you're a user and you know they're using Polygon or not. Polygon's mission here is to like scale Ethereum and then secondarily to like uh, to spread Polygon technology to as many users as possible. Our goal here is to like enable the world to transition into like a blockchain powered world. It's not really about like branding and people knowing, like they'll know, right? Like, don't get me wrong, 
Uh, but I, I think that like, if you look at something like uh, Bored Apes, right? So MoonPay was, uh, was sponsoring Bored Apes, like celebrities to buy Bored Apes. They were like subsidizing it, right? Um, and that's part of how like the apes became like the hot NFT within like Hollywood. Um, most people buying an ape probably didn't really know, like they didn't have a MetaMask like wallet or, you know, they had like some assistant of theirs helping set it up. They don't, they don't know how to recover if they like lose their private key or, you know, like the, the amount that they know that they're on Ethereum is pretty small. But the, that whole campaign worked wonders for Ethereum, right? Like all of a sudden you had people talking about Ethereum NFTs on national television. And, you know, that like I would argue that like the value accrued to Ethereum from that campaign is enormous, even though like the end user like wasn't really that like uh, sophisticated or, or aware of like what, what network they were on. And so my final question for both of you guys, maybe you can give me, you know, a two, three minute quick answer. And I'll, you know, I'll start with you, Colin, and then go to you, Matt. Um, looking ahead, you know, towards the rest of the year uh, and, and beyond, what are you most excited about for, for Polygon and for crypto and, and Web3 more broadly? What's next for you guys? And a final question to just make it a lot of questions in one, uh, as, we, we have seen while the U.S. has has come down quite hard on crypto, the EU, uh, the U.K., the Middle East, Hong Kong have really started to open their doors to embrace crypto, to welcome crypto companies, to bring forth thoughtful legislation. Where do you see the opportunities outside of the U.S. in those different specific regions, both broadly, but I guess, Colin, for you specifically, I'm curious specifically on the institutional side. So what are you most excited about for crypto and Polygon? What are you most excited about globally for Polygon from an institutional perspective? Yeah, with the first question, it's, it's almost a weak answer because it's super broad, right? There's adoption taking place in every vertical within Polygon from like gaming to NFTs to DeFi. There's massive amounts of innovation taking place. Like that's why I wake up every day super excited because this industry hasn't stopped. Like it hasn't stopped for FTX or any other headline because the technology is so powerful, the adoption keeps, keeps happening. So that, that's, that's first and foremost. Specifically with an institutional, my excitement is largely around rewiring the global financial system. That means tokenization. That means settlement on chain. It makes things faster, more efficient, de-risks. Uh, and in the background, and here's the thing, like people don't see it, right? Your average person doesn't see it. It's happening super fast. Like all the major players see the value. Uh, and so they're working it in the background. So in the next three to six months, I see a lot happening on that front. I think there's going to be a lot of announcements around tokenization. In terms of the regulatory environment, again, I don't see that substantially stopping the work being done on blockchain because it's if it, it, it can be looked at as a technology, as a technology platform, as a utility. If it has value, I don't really see the conflict with, with regulation. I'm probably maybe an outlier in, in the blockchain industry, but I see the adoption of this technology as just not really intersecting uh, with, with need for regulation, right? This is open source code on the internet. I, I see them as two separate ideas. In terms of geographic variation, yes. In, in terms of crypto, you see places like the UAE, as Singapore, as Hong Kong, I also think of uh, London and to some degree Europe as being more industry forward. And so I, I see them as looking at the United States and saying, okay, here's an opportunity for us to be the forerunner in an emerging technology. And it's probably a rare opportunity. I, you know, Matt and I are both based in the US, actually we all are, right? I don't think we tend to see the advantages in a lot of technologies. I think those other geographies and jurisdictions see us as kind of seeding the advantage. They see an opening and so they're leaning into it. So you, you could easily see faster innovation in the coming months, you know, not years, but coming like three to six month time frame uh, in those geographies specifically. In the US, it's really hard to see how it plays out, right? It, it plays out behind closed doors with very specific actors and players for various motivations. It's, it's kind of tough to handicap that. Handicap that. But in the meantime, again, you know, kind of with the, the Franklin Templeton example, I see the industry moving forward, even with the existing uh, regulatory framework. Matt, let's uh, same question for you. 
Uh, you're on mute. You're on mute. Thanks. Uh, I'm excited about probably too many things. Um, so I'll try to like whittle it down. Um, the I I really think Polygon 2.0 is like in an enormous change in the way that we're going to think about block space. And for me, that's super exciting because it creates the substrate upon which everything is going to get built, right? Um, so from a, from a tech perspective, I'm super, super excited about that. Um, from, a, from an application perspective, I think that like these sorts of like big name, like mass user partnerships, things like Franklin Templeton, things like Nike and, you know, Fortnite and all that, I think these things are finally starting to hit like fruition. They're no longer like headlines, right? They're real products. To me, that's going to like substantially increase the number of people that are living, breathing, thinking about crypto. And that's going to bring in talented, innovative builders, people that have great ideas, people that are thinking creatively. Um, it's, it's just going to like uh, serve as like a spark that, that ignites like a huge powder keg of innovation. Um, so for me, all of the ingredients are coming together for big uh, steps forward in terms of like real world actual usage for, for things that users find valuable um, in, in the crypto space. Um, from a regulatory perspective, it's really easy to forget a couple of things. The first one is it's easy to forget that this is a very global industry. Like at Polygon, like we have a lot of employees, I, I think the majority are outside the US, right? The vast majority, right? Um, founders are all ex-US, right? Uh, it's a big world out there, right? Um, and all it takes is like one or two visits to like Singapore or Dubai to see, or Hong Kong now, to see the excitement about crypto, to like really assuage any concern that like the US having a harsher regulatory regime is gonna like cause issues. Um, the second thing that's easy to forget is that like the actions taken by the SEC are like not, they're not law, right? Like the SEC doesn't get to write the laws. Uh, they get to take the actions that are like within their purview to take. And then it's up to the courts and Congress and elected officials to determine laws. And, you know, I wouldn't say that uh, I'm, I'm in a bit of an echo chamber, but I wouldn't say that there's unilateral support to like remove crypto entirely from, from the U.S., uh, you know, in a, in a legal way. Um, but it's going to take a little time, right? These things like crypto, you know, number one thing is like the, the attention span is like, 10 minutes like mo nobody's probably even listening to me anymore right <laughs> um the attention span is super super short and and so um as a result like it's easy to get worried about a headline and then not stick around for like the next couple of years to see how it plays out so um i i'm optimistic that not only will like the global crypto world uh just continue to evolve at, at a huge like clip but also that i, I think that in the u.s we're, we're gonna see like a lot more regulatory friendliness coming and, and certainty, hopefully. So one final question from the audience, I think is a great one, which is uh, Sean Grubb is asking as a builder, what are the number one and number two rate reasons he should prioritize building on Polygon over Solana, Arbitrum and other L2s? So we'll leave that as the final thought. And, and, yeah. and maybe Matt, that's, that, that's probably a you question. Yeah, uh, I mean, look, you know, broadly speaking, uh, I, lo I love that this is even a question that can get asked. I'm, I'm so glad that there are great options for places for builders to go. So like, it's, uh, I don't want anyone to misinterpret this as me being negative on those other platforms in any way. They're, they're awesome. Um, for Polygon in particular, EVM compatibility comes first, right? Like building on Solana is just a hard thing um, and it's hard to get right and it's hard to get high quality auditors there. I, I think if I were building, I would choose the EVM ecosystem, like, you know, probably for the next couple of years, at least. The second reason is really the community. Uh, it's the, the community of, of users, of builders, uh, of supporters. Um, and, you know, like everything in crypto, it's a social consensus, right? Like, if the users are on Polygon, you want to be on Polygon, right? If the TVL is on Polygon, you want to be on Polygon. Um, if the, the brands that you want to partner with are on Polygon, you want to be on Polygon. And so it becomes about the other humans in the space and where are they choosing to build. And at Polygon, we're really lucky to have just like a really high quality community. Awesome. Well, thank you both. This was, this was, I think this was actually our best quarterly call yet. I really enjoyed this one. I learned a lot. I hope the audience also enjoyed. We got a bunch of nice comments. So thank you both. And uh, I look forward to seeing you guys next quarter. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. It's been a pleasure.